Okay, hi everybody. This is Bill Neville with the Entrust Group. We're going to go ahead and uh, and get started. I want to welcome uh, Jay Butler with Asset Protection of America Services, who's our um, featured subject matter expert for this uh, for this month's webinar. And uh, today we're going to be talking about investing with um, with an LLC using a, an LLC within your IRA to primarily uh, establish checkbook control is usually the reason why we see that. But Jay's going to provide some pretty detailed information on the various uh, benefits you can get from having an LLC within your IRA. So. As always, if you've attended these webinars before, we always put this disclosure up here, which essentially says that uh, the Entrust Group does not give advice. Uh, we are strictly a custodian and record keeper of your retirement account. Uh, so before you make any investments, we encourage you to talk to any advisors, uh, CPAs, um, lawyers before entering into any type of investment, but that's not the role that Entrust will play. For any investment that you make, we are strictly a custodian and record keeper. We do not do any due diligence or research or provide any advisory services on any investment that you make. Uh, so real quickly, we're gonna, I'm gonna just give a quick overview about Entrust. Um, and then uh, kind of at that point, Jay's gonna take over. Uh, he's gonna talk about what exactly is in, when it means an entity, when talking about an entity, go over some low risk versus high risk assets, um, then some information about doing inside and outside lawsuits or what goes on, um, changing charging order protections. And then at the end, we'll have a Q&A. Um, down at the bottom of your screen, you should have a Q&A box uh, where you can type in your question at any time, whether it's for myself about self-directed IRAs or for Jay specifically about what he's gonna be talking about with the LLCs. And then we're going to answer all the questions at the end. Uh, so that's me. I've been with Entrust for a little over 12 years. And my role as business development manager is primarily to educate uh, clients and prospective clients and investment sponsors and whoever uh, about what are self-directed IRAs and how they work. As far as interest, we're actually at $5 billion currently. We need to update this slide. We're at over $5 billion in assets under administration. We have uh, over 22,000 accounts. We've been in business since 1981, so going on 42 years now. And we provide a single point of contact for anybody who opens an account with us. It's one of our differentiators from our competitors. Uh, for most uh, companies in our space, if you have an account, uh, you're going to call and you have questions or need assistance, you're going to call an 800 number or reach out to the general client services and get whoever happens to pick up the phone. Uh, but with Entrust, you get a you get assigned a business development manager. So I'm one of four in the company. I have my region. And so if you're in my region, you would have me and then we each have an associate who reports to us. So you have a direct contact for any questions or any help that you might need. Uh, our role is self-directed IRA custodian and record keeper. Uh, the majority of the staff that have qualified are certified IRA service professionals. We have offices throughout the United States, which is where the business development managers are. And then we're headquartered in Oakland, California. Uh, we do events like this, and whether in person or virtual, virtual webinars, we go to trade shows and things like that to try and bring more awareness of self-directed IRAs. Um, we do have a continuing edu education program for certain um, for certain um, uh, people, uh, realtors, uh, CPAs, financial advisors. We have a continuing education program. So if you're interested in something like that, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we have to be invited to do it. We don't just sort of set those up. But if a realtor association, for example, wanted us to do our continuing education program for their group of realtors, then we'd be happy to do it. Uh, and then we have our uh, twice a year IRA Academy where we train other people uh, in our industry uh, on, on uh, what they need to know to pass the certified IRA service professional uh, designation. We're the only company in the space that has that, uh, has that program. So what exactly is a self-directed IRA? It's two things. It is a retirement account in which the account holder is responsible for making all their own investment decisions and doing their own due diligence. And two, where you can invest in non-traditional investments. So if you hear 
Fidelity or Merrill Lynch or Charles Schwab or somebody like that saying they offer a self-directed IRA because they allow you to pick all your own stocks. It's not truly self-directed because they're limiting you to stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. You can't invest in real estate or private equity or private debt or precious metals or anything like that through them. You're still limited in the investment options, whereas the IRS uh, mostly doesn't limit you. Um, so with a self-directed custodian, you can invest outside that limited uh, Wall Street assets of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. But in order for a retirement account to qualify as a retirement account, it has to be held and administered by a custodian. And so the Entrust Group, we have our own trust company called the Entrust Trust Company uh, that acts as custodian. And the Entrust Group acts as the administrator or otherwise known as record keeper of your retirement account. So before I'm going to pass this on to Jay, we're going to pop up a really quick poll uh, that's going to appear for about a half a minute. Uh, if you guys would just answer that and uh, and then we'll move on. So uh, Jay, at this point, I'm going to put myself on mute and I will be back uh, to take the Q&A at the end. Jay, Jay it's uh, your, your show. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Great, you Jay. Need to pass just going to let you know we have about a 57 of 90 answer. And as I relinquish this, going to shut off mine and let you show yours. Okay. Cool. Pause share. Made you host again. And we have Wonderful. about all our answers. So I'm going to go ahead and let you take over from there. Thank you so much. Wonderful. And let me turn on video. Start video. Outstanding. There we go. Okay. Can everyone hear me all right? Sounds great. Oh, great. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Well, my name is Jay Butler. Uh, I'm the Managing Director of Asset Protection Services of America. Um, you're welcome to take notes during this presentation if you would like. I do believe it's also being recorded. It might be made available to you at a later point in time. Uh, really, the only thing that I wanted to share with you is just please be sure to write down our website assetprotectionservices.com. At the end of this, there is no sales pitch um, other than to say we welcome the opportunity to give you a free 90-minute consultation whenever you want, if you want. We have flat rates. There's zero pressure. So that's all that's being sold is free. So that's our website, assetprotectionservices.com. Um, I suppose the one disclaimer I get to provide you, just as Bill did, and thank you very much, uh, Bill, by the way, for the, the kind introduction as well. Um, I am not an attorney, so I am precluded, prohibited, uh, prevented from giving you any legal, financial, or tax advice. So there you go. Uh, jumping right in, I've been in the industry now for 19 years, uh, since 2004. Um, I graduated at Boston University. I started in the industry with an attorney and former judge from California, Alan Russell, at the offices in, in Las Vegas. After a number of years, I kind of went up the ladder and began working with uh, Carl E. Lovell Jr. He was the former attorney of Vegas and uh, North Las Vegas, um, used to live in Switzerland doing international corporate compliance. And now I uh, run two companies. One is Asset Protection Services of America. We're a corporation service provider, a commercial registered agent, as well as our state trustee services LLC for our land trusts and uh, investors who have real estate. So our offices are in uh, Carson City, Nevada, as well as uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming, arguably the top two incorporation jurisdictions in America, although we do form entities uh, throughout all 50 states in America. And as a side note, I guess I've written uh, eight books on the subject matter because many of you may not know me. So um, there you go. Uh, we also have uh, videos on our website. They're free. Um, several of the principal concepts, uh, two of them in particular that I'm going to be sharing with you today. We have little videos on there. They're really short, like 30 seconds to three minutes, but they're pretty fun and get across uh, really important concepts in a fun, unintimidating manner, which is really helpful uh, for you to be able to absorb and retain it. All right. Do you need asset protection with a self-directed IRA? Great question. So unlike a 401k, self-directed IRAs are not protected under ERISA, which are your Employer Retirement Investment Securities Act of 1974-1975. Also, in the event of litigation, IRAs file form 5498. 
And while that form does not detail the specific assets held in the self-directed IRA, the total valuation of the account is disclosed and could be obtained by the plaintiff during discovery. So you want to be able to protect your assets in your self-directed IRA, particularly if they are um, you know, a substantial or meaningful amount to you. And in order to do that, you really must be proactive. I've had this little phrase I've been trying to coin for 20 years, maybe it's stuck, but asset protection is akin to wearing a seatbelt. In a moment of an accident, if you've ever gone flying toward a windshield or been you know, feeling that motion until the seatbelt catches you, you cannot go flying toward the windshield and then try to turn around and install an airbag, right? I mean, your assets are either protected or they're not. You've got to be proactive. So you have a choice. Uh, you can leave all of your retirement savings together in the name of your self-directed IRAs as an individual. And depending on the amount of the fund, that, that could be fine. Or you could place them into a single member limited liability company, which is disregarded for tax purposes. And when it comes to entities, that is your choice. There is one choice and one only. So some of the questions we're going to be covering today, uh, what exactly is an entity, this instance, an LLC? Why would you want to consider using one? Uh, do you need more than one LLC? If so, why? And how many are you supposed to have exactly? Um, are there unique advantages or disadvantages to using an LLC to house your self-directed IRA? And does it really matter in which state you choose to organize your limited liability company? So as we move along, we've got these four steps. Um, again, uh, Bill was kind enough to share with you that there'll be a nice question and answer at the end. So we're just going to be moving right along. We've got a lot of ground to cover, a limited amount of time. So let's jump right in. Number one, what is an entity? And when you really stop and think about it, have you ever stopped and thought about it? What is an entity? Uh, but if you look it up in Black's Law Dictionary, uh, the word entity is defined as a person. An entity is a person. And a person is defined as one, a human being, such as ourselves, natural persons, individuals, or an entity um, that is recognized by law as having most of the rights and duties of a human being, such as a corporation, limited liability company, or limited partnership. So on this example that I put together, if there's you, the flesh and blood human being, and then next to you is a piece of paper, which is an entity, in the eyes of the judge, you're both persons. It's crazy, right? So if one of you had to get burned alive at the stake, metaphorically speaking, of course, it's a rhetorical question, which would, would you want to be burned alive, you or the piece of paper? Piece of paper. But this is a very important concept to understand. It's kind of like having a, a compass. As long as you can find true north, wherever you're at, um, you can find your way to safety, no matter where you find yourself in the world. It's an important principle to understand. Never bring the pain home. So if you're putting yourself out there, you can really get injured. Whereas if you put a buffer, a piece of paper between you and the rest of society, it can uh, prevent a lot of damage from occurring in your life or limit it, mitigate it. So the next concept is uh, low and high risk assets. Okay. A low risk asset is really anything of intrinsic value, which is incapable of causing or generating a lawsuit. So cash, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, gold coins, Rolexes, jewelry, artwork, cryptocurrency, right? Anything that in and of itself, just sitting there, it can't do anything to cause or generate a lawsuit. It's a safe asset. Just think of a safe, right? Or a vault, same principle. A high-risk asset, conversely, is any asset which may cause or generate a lawsuit, which could be cars, boats, planes, equipment, businesses, things of that nature, anything that um, could run into something else, explode, detonate, cause death or destruction. And while this may not be rocket science, right, we do try to put the fun back in fundamentals, low risk and high risk assets are like oil and water, right? They always separate, they don't mix. And you might ask, well, why not? Because of the difference between inside and outside lawsuits, which is our segue to section number three, inside and outside lawsuits. You'd be surprised. A lot of people have never even heard of this concept before. Um, 
they might you, you might not have you might not know anything about this. If you do, hang with us till we get to uh, charging order protection. But inside and outside lawsuits, an outside lawsuit is where the cause of action, which is a, a fancy way of saying <clears throat> why are you suing me, right? What's the reason for the lawsuit? Where the cause of action is not directly related to the business activities of the entity. So in this illustration, the submarine is your limited liability company. Okay. And if you were to experience a fender bender and a lawsuit ensues from some type of vehicle accident, the car accident, that lawsuit was generated because of the accident. They're going to sue the driver and the owner, right? But it had nothing to do with the business activities of the company. And so that's called an outside suit. Okay. Conversely, an inside suit is let's say you have a limited liability company and you title. Uh, three investment properties into the name of the same limited liability company. If there's a fire or a flood, black mold, a sinkhole, slip and fall, take your pick. Whatever assets are inside that property are at risk, okay? Because the charging order protection, which we're going to cover next, is not applicable to an inside suit, Okay, so there's very little, if anything, that can be done to protect your assets in an entity after you have been served with a lawsuit. Remember, you have to be proactive. So insurance or encumbrances can help, right? If it's indebted and you don't have a lot of equity in it, obviously that's going to help. Um, but all of the assets owned within the uh, entity are subject to seizure from a judgment creditor. So the good news is notwithstanding, you know, fraud or gross negligence, stupid stuff, you know, human trafficking, weapon dealing. I mean, you kind of got to be an idiot, right? Owners of an entity have no personal liability for the debts or the obligations of the company. All right. Unless you co-sign on a loan, unless you've voluntarily gone into a, a debt <clears throat> um, willingly. Okay. Um, owner liability is limited to your capital contribution in the entity, thus limiting your losses. I mean, that's literally why it's called a limited liability company. Okay. So with regard to capital contribution, members are not liable for the debts and the obligations of the LLC. Your liability is limited to the respective capital contribution that you put into the company. So sitting at a poker table, if the poker table is the entity and you're the member and you've got a, a million dollars in the company, but you've got $10 million behind your back, you're only risking what you've contributed into the company, right? Not the $10 million at your back, whatever you've put into the company, that's the limit of your risk or liability. So the solution is basically compartmentalization. So before where we had three houses inside one submarine or one limited liability company, depending on the amount of equity that you have in the home, you would want to separate those out. So if the beach house caught fire or there was a flood or some type of you know, death a, a, you know, that brought about a serious litigation, you could in theory lose your $100,000 of investment in that property. But you don't also want to needlessly lose your $300,000 into the quadplex or your vacation house, right? The, the, the additional rental house can't be a vacation house basically because it's a self-directed IRA, but you get the point. So that's inside and outside lawsuits. Okay. So to recap is if something, if, if an entity owns something and something goes wrong in the company, they can go after whatever the company owns. If the company owns something and there's a lawsuit that happens outside of it, they can't come after the company. Okay. Inside and outside lawsuits. So, Charging order protection. This is also known as asset protection. Charging orders are what give you your asset protection. All right, let me explain. A charging order is technically a remedy. A remedy means solution, right? They're, they're, inter, they're synonymous, they're interchangeable. So a charging order is a solution that a creditor, right? So you go to court, you have a plaintiff who's suing you, you're the defendant, they kick your butt and now they become a creditor and you're the debtor, all right? And you've got a huge debt that you have to repay them, okay? So the creditor places a judgment against the entity. Let's say they want to go after your company, all right? It's from something that happened because of the car accident, okay? That solution or remedy 
ironically, becomes the primary defense for you. The solution for the creditor becomes your defense. If that was clear as mud, I'm going to explain it in words, and then I'm going to give you a really great visualization to understand this. So let's say a person sued you, and they won, and now they obtained this charging order against you, all right? That person, okay, which is now a judgment creditor, has what's called the rights of an assignee. The rights of an assignee are the rights to the distribution of profits, but not the interests of an assignee, which is the ownership. Okay, again, I'm going to show you an illustration in just a moment. So the judgment creditor who took you to court, kicked your butt, won, and has this charging order against you. They have no control or ability to participate in the management of the entity. They have no say as to when or in what amounts distributions may be made. They have no authority to force distributions. And they basically have no ability to exercise any measure of control over the entity at all. So the charging order protects the uh, interest or, or assets from for other investors from the judgment creditors of a debtor owner, meaning 47 of the 50 states require two members to have this charging order protection. There are only three states that in writing, in the legislation, as afford it to an, uh, an LLC with one or more than one member, which is Nevada, Wyoming, and Delaware, okay? So here is the proverbial crystal ball. We have Santa Claus in the middle with, uh, I don't think that's Rudolph, but it's one of the reindeers, all right? And let's say that, you know, Santa Claus was at the bar and he was having a great time on December 26th after a very successful delivery of millions of packages at light of speed and got into a fight or something with one of the elves, okay? And so the elves take Santa Claus to court. They get a very sympathetic elf jury. They kick his butt and they have this huge judgment against him, all right? So the creditor on the outside of this little snow globe, it's not really a crystal ball, it's more than a snow globe. This leech, which is the creditor on the outside of this snow globe, is just sitting there waiting for a distribution to be made out of the company, just just sitting there waiting, okay? So the snow globe is the entity. That's your limited liability company. Uh, Santa Claus is the debtor, right? He lost the court case with the creditor, which is previously the plaintiff. And the other owner, the second owner with Santa Claus in this particular, I don't know, maybe they have like an Amazon business, right? Santa, Santa Claus is expanding. Um, so Santa Claus is in business with the reindeer and all of the snow that's falling in the snow globe is, is money. It's just pouring rain with pouring money, okay? The creditor has to wait for a distribution to be made. So Santa Claus is protected vicariously because the courts are trying to protect the reindeer. That's normally why you need two members, okay? But this is basically a really good illustration of how the charging order protects, the protection works. Oh, okay, I have a great slide in here on, sorry, where'd my slide go? I'm missing a slide, but that is okay. Um, what, my, what the slide that I'm missing would say is, so the person who sued you and won and has this, oh, it's, it's later, I'm jumping. Okay, good, I didn't miss it. Whew. All right, my apologies. So we finished our judgment creditors uh, illustration. Okay, my apologies. So what happens when there are no other investors to protect? What happens if it is just Santa Claus and there's no reindeer? How does that work? There was a very famous uh, court case called Ashley Albright. It was a, a bankruptcy court in Colorado, which is technically federal. And the judge said the charging order uh, lim limitation serves no purpose. Charging order limitation serves no purpose in a single member limited liability company because there are no other parties interests affected. And what that means is if you have this snow globe, which is your limited liability company and there's just Santa Claus in it and there's no reindeer to protect, the leech will just go right through the entity and take all of the profits, all of the snow, all of the money, take it all away from Santa Claus, right? That's why most states require two people because of that, um, uh, legislation and also another one, uh, FTC versus Olmstead in Florida in 2012.
So you want to pick one of the three favorable states. That's I was just a little ahead of myself before. Okay, Nevada, Wyoming, and Delaware. Okay, it's the exclusive remedy for a judgment creditor. They have no other options. For example, in Nevada, the judgment creditor has only the rights of an assignee, which remember are the rights of the distributions. They have no ownership interest. It is the exclusive remedy. It applies to one member or more than one member and no other remedy, which is a solution without limitation is available to the judgment creditor and no other remedy may be ordered by a court. They just stranglehold it. That's all they get. Okay. Same thing in Wyoming under Title 17. Now, this is where it's really good. I don't know about you. I would struggle to think of anything with regards to the IRS that I like or enjoy or that has benefited my life. How about you? All right. But there is one thing. It is IRS Revenue Ruling 77-137. And what it states is that for federal income tax purposes, B, and this kind of long legal legalese, B, which is the leech, okay, is treated as a substituted limited partner for Santa Claus and the reindeer. What that means is, and this is the slide I was looking for, my apologies, a person who sues you and won and has a charging order against you, they have to pay taxes on money they cannot collect. How is that for retribution, right? So rather than you owning the self-directed IRA in your individual name, which is subject to seizure and litigation, if you were sued individually and you lost the lawsuit and now they want to come after your retirement account, but it's inside a properly structured single member limited liability company, disregard tax purposes in a favorable jurisdiction like Nevada, Wyoming, and Delaware, not only do they not get your retirement in the self-directed IRA, they have to pay taxes on the monies that would have otherwise been distributed to you. They have to pay taxes on money they're never going to see. I mean, that's pretty cool. Pretty brilliant. But not all st states are the same, right? Love California, but sorry, you know, a court may appoint a receiver. The court may order a foreclosure at any time. There's more holes in it than Swiss cheese, right? You got to pick the right state. So um, I'm at the end and this is kind of a, a flow chart. It's like a bicycle wheel. Okay, so I'm at the end of my presentation, just so that you know. So the structure that you want to be taking into consideration is think of a bicycle wheel. Don't reinvent the wheel. It's a little corny, but it's true. You would have a hub in the center, right? The hub never meets the road. The rubber never meets the road at the hub, right? Your hub is your holding company. And your self-directed IRA owns your Wyoming single member limited liability company. And the Wyoming company can hold the safe assets that we were talking about before. Cash, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, CDs, brokerage accounts, gold coin, Rolexes, artwork, mink code, cryptocurrencies. Remember, anything which in and of itself is incapable of causing or generating a lawsuit. Now, if, <clears throat> if all your, all, respectfully, if all you're ever going to have in your self-directed IRA are safe assets, that's really all you need is the Wyoming hub. You don't have to go beyond that, okay? But if you want the IRA to be able to move into real estate while you still have safe assets, because you could have both, right? You could have safe assets in your self-directed IRA and you could have high-risk assets. And remember, they don't mix. You, you keep them separated. Your Wyoming company can own what's called wholly owned subsidiaries or basically baby LLCs. Okay, so if you have real estate in Ohio or Florida or Texas or Arizona, those LLCs can hold title and separate or mitigate the liability in each property. So if something went wrong on your Florida company and the insurance company didn't cover it, maybe there's black mold right? And no insurance company covers black mold. And so you lose the litigation. You could lose your house in Florida. That, that could happen to any real estate investor, right? Whether it's self-directed IRA or not, but you wouldn't lose your properties in Ohio. Maybe they have land trusts. If there's uh, debt or encumbrances on the property, you wouldn't lose your property in Texas or Arizona or all of the safe assets in the Wyoming company. 
Okay. So, and I'll leave this slide up when we come back for, for Q and A's, whatever you want. Uh, but this is a really good visual and you, you grow as you go, right? So you only add the little baby companies as you purchase more uh, investment properties into your self-directed, uh, you know, retirement account. And then as you sell them, you kind of funk, pull a spoke out, uh, dissolve that LLC. So you never have more than what you need. You're never over packaged or, you know, under packaged. Okay. It's like the bowl of porridge. We want it to be just right. So that's it. Uh, please be sure or feel free to schedule an appointment with us. It just takes you to a little calendar. You repick any day and week and time. Uh, we're available Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific, 45 hours a, a week, closed on weekends and national holidays. Um, and, and that's it. So let me turn it back over to uh, Bill and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, do I need to stop screen sharing? I think. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, we usually... We usually bring up a screen that shows both our contact information. Um, okay, great. So um, this is just some information on some upcoming, the next webinar, we're gonna be talking about um, digital investing and uh, feel free to go to our website or to our social media for any more information you want on self-directed IRAs. And uh, all right, time for the Q and A. And there's our contact information. So we'll leave that up there um, for oh, anybody cool. who wants our contact info. All right, so let's jump right in. <clears throat> so the first question asks, how to incorporate the IRA LLC into the living estate trust? Any specific language in the LLC documents? Thank you. So when you have an IRA, um, you're the beneficiary of your IRA, but then you can name beneficiaries in the event of your death. So you can name the living trust, the living estate as the living estate trust as the beneficiary to your account. So you're kind of backwards on this. You're asking how to incorporate the IRA LLC into the living estate trust. That's not what you're going to do. You're going to name the living estate trust as the beneficiary of the IRA itself. <clears throat> so that when you pass, then the assets or that account becomes part of the estate. And then it, you know, based on the estate documents, then it'll it'll be um it'll be passed down to any of the beneficiaries that you name in your estate trust. Okay. I, Jay, I don't know if you have anything you want to expand on that. That's pretty specifically IRA type stuff. Yeah, no, absolutely. You could list your uh spouse as an immediate. Uh, beneficiary and then make the trust as an alternate or the, the like you said, the trust directly. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. All right. So this one's for you. What does disregarded mean? Okay. So disregarded entity means that uh, normally a limited liability company would be reported on one of the schedules of your 1040 individual income tax return. Normally schedule C it's a, if it's active, schedule E if it's passive. Uh, but of course, your IRA has different uh, reporting requirements. Uh, what is it? A 5498 form. Um, hope I got that right. Um, but it, it basically means there's no separate tax return for the company. It's reported directly or indirectly through your uh, 1040 individual income tax return. Okay, so the next two questions are from the same person who basically wanted us to get right to explaining how does one um, use an LLC within the IRA. So <clears throat> within a re an IRA, like, and let's use real estate as an example, you basically have two options. Either your IRA can invest directly in the property or your IRA can invest into an LLC and then the LLC holds title on the property. When you have an IRA, the IRA itself is the entity that's going to own whatever investment you make. So if your IRA is going to hold direct title on the property, then the name of the, the title holder is going to be with us, the Entrust Group for benefit of your name and account number. The for benefit of gets shortened to FBO. So the Entrust Group, FBO, your name and account number. If you decide you want to structure it through an LLC, then you simply will set up an LLC and then name the IRA as the member of the LLC or otherwise known as the owner 
or investor of the LLC. So again, the Entrust Group, FBO, your name and account number becomes the member of the LLC. So you would submit to Entrust, submit to your custodian the operating agreement showing the IRA listed as the member. Now you can name yourself as the manager of that LLC. And note, I'm not saying managing member, but manager because the IRA itself would be the member. If you're funding it, if you're creating a single member LLC where it's solely owned by the IRA, then the IRA itself becomes the member of that LLC. So instead of your IRA investing directly in real estate, your IRA owns or becomes the investor into the LLC and then the LLC holds title on the real estate. So you would create the LLC, you would create the operating agreement, you would open the bank account, you would be the signatory if you name, assuming you're going to be the manager, you would be the signatory on behalf of the LLC, you can make whatever investments you want to hold under that LLC. But the LLC is owned and funded by the IRA, which means that if you're getting rental income, it, the LLC owns the property, the LLC receives the rental income, the LLC pays any expenses. But if you decide at some point you want to take a withdrawal for personal use or you want to transfer some of that money back to a different custodian, then it has to flow from the LLC back to the IRA. And then you take the withdrawal from the IRA because, again, it's the IRA that is the investor or the member or the owner of that LLC. Again, Jay, I don't know if you have any, that was very specifically IRA directed. So I don't know if you had anything you want. Yeah, to Yeah, no, 100% correct. The only thing I was showing to add to that in the presentation is to create one more layer, depending on how many assets the IRA itself is holding. So if you're buying, I don't know, let's say maybe a, a commercial property or one larger investment, and that's really all the IRA is going to be doing, you're not going to be branching out into two or three or four or five or six different investment properties. You, uh, Bill is 100% correct. You would only need the one um, hub. It just depends if, you're, if you have safe assets and you also have real estate or if you have multiple real estate, then we just need to have one more layer and that's it. So it just depends on how much you're putting into the into the IRA. But yeah, that, that's but, correct. But yeah. ultimately, the point is, is that the IRA becomes the member of, you know, the entity that you're sure. in. Right. And, and so yep. and that's and you just have to instruct your custodian. You just have. But you do that through submitting in a, the the operating agreement for the LLC. If you were investing directly in real estate, then you would submit the purchase contract and the closing documents for the real estate. If you were doing a note, you would submit the note. Right. Everything has to flow through the custodian in the name of the IRA. So whatever investment you're choosing to do, in this case, an LLC, it just requires you setting up that LLC in the name of the IRA and submitting it to the custodian. Okay, um, can the second member be a spouse? So I'm, I'm gonna answer this real quick, Jay, and then let you jump mm -hmm. in. But when, you're, when your IRA is investing into an entity, and again, in this case, an LLC, but when it's purchasing something, it can partner <clears throat> with anybody at the time of investment. So if you want to like use an IRA and then also use your spouse's IRA to fund an LLC, yes, you can do that as long as you're doing that at the time that you basically create the LLC. <clears throat> what I mean by that is if, if your spouse already has an LLC and you want to fund, add additional funds to that LLC with your IRA, that's prohibited. Because that LLC is a prohibited, that's a that's a prohibited entity from your IRA investing because your spouse is a disqualified person to you. But if you want to partner with your spouse on a new investment or on a new entity into an LLC, then yes, you can you can partner your IRA along with your spouse, along with your spouse's IRA, along with your kids, your parents, along with yourself as an entity, but or as an investor into that, as a member into that LLC. But again, you have to do that on a new investment. It can't be an already existing LLC that is already has a, a disqualified person as a as an owner of that of that LLC. Okay. okay. Um, next question: Does the LLC have to hold title? I don't. Jay, I, that seems geared towards you. Uh, generally speaking, yes. The caveat would be if there is a mortgage or loan on the property. So if the IRA were to purchase the, the property in the name of the IRA, and then it tries to transfer the property into the LLC, the bank could invoke what's called a due on sale clause and accelerate the loan and call the note due. 
So if there's a mortgage involved, um, because it depends whether or not it's commercial or residential, we make use of a, a land trust with residential properties to prevent the banks from invoking a due on sale clause. Um, it's called the Garn St. Germain Depository Institutions Act um, under the 89th Congress. But normally, yes, the, the property would be titled directly into the LLC designated to, to hold that property. Um, if it's commercial, they'll almost require that you have an LLC for it. You don't, not to say that you don't have a choice, but they, they pretty much expect it, you know, when, when you're dealing with commercial property. So generally to answer your question, yes. But you're talking about transferring an act, like an existing asset that's held in an IRA. I mean, if you want to use an LLC um, and you, you know, instead of having your IRA hold direct title, um, in short, yes, the LLC is going to be the title holder, right? It's either going correct, to be the correct. IRA holds title or the LLC is going to be hold title. If your question is, can you be the person, can you individually hold title while it is while you're involving an IRA or the LLC and the IRA, the answer to that is no. Either the IRA has to hold direct title or the LLC has to hold direct title, but it's, it's one of those two options. <clears throat> okay, um, Jay, would you consider first mortgages a lower high-risk asset? Uh, neither. Uh, that's just a, a, a lien or an encumbrance. It's what the mortgage is for. If, if it's a mortgage, it means it's an investment property, which means by default, it's high risk. Um, how do I how do I rephrase that? It, it's not the mortgage, which is higher, low risk. It's the asset for which you have obtained the mortgage, right? Or, or the loan. So if, if, if it's real estate, it, it's high risk. I mean, that's it's basically asking is a trustee investment considered a high risk investment, right? I, I would probably personally would probably follow that as I mean, that falls into an alternative asset, right? Like that's not something you're going to be doing with Charles Schwab, Merrill Lynch companies like that, which means that you're the one who's going to be responsible for doing any due diligence. And so ultimately, trustee investments, would they be considered high risk investments? I would say they're more high risk than than, you know, stocks, publicly traded stocks, public, you know, exchange traded mutual funds, cash, um, you know, any of those easily liquidated investments, right? Would you not agree? Well, though, yeah, those are not high risk assets. I mean, your your risk is whether or not they're going to return yeah. an investment that you're seeking. But yeah, those are low risk. Yeah. Yeah, real I estate mean, is high risk. Period. Are you going to, yeah. yeah, real estate would be, and that's a real <laughs> estate type of investment because it's collateralized by real estate. I mean, it's a note collateralized by real estate. If they don't pay the note, then you can foreclose on the property and now you've got legal consequences you know, that you have okay. to in terms of getting that done. So she asked me about a, if it was a she, she asked me about a mortgage. Notes are different, unless but, I misunderstood the question. Notes are not high mortgage, risk. But isn't a first mortgage otherwise known as a trustee investment, which is just a note collateralized by real estate? Okay, so what you're talking about the person or the bank or the institution providing the mortgage, which is basically a note if you're doing it individually and you're not well, I was, in front of a bank. Yeah, I was, talking, I was looking at it as from a standpoint of first mortgage is that the individual or the oh. or the lender, right? A trust. Oh, sorry. So then, 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 no, that is not a high risk asset. So long as they don't default on the note and, and you're in the wonderful position for you where you actually then have the property go into foreclosure and you take the property. When you take the property, the property then becomes high risk and you would title it into a different company than the one where you have the, the note on it. But the note itself is not high risk. It's safe. It's a safe asset. No. It's just a, a you're, you're a lien holder. So that is safe. Sorry if I misunderstood the question. OK, uh, what if you have more than one member in your LLC, then do you still need to form an LLC in Wyoming, Nevada, et cetera? I'm not sure I understand that question. That's outside the scope of a self-directed IRA because it's an individual retirement account as opposed to a multi, you know, an MRA, which is a multi-member, I don't know, or, or spousal RR, IR, you know, retirement well, account. But I mean, IRAs can partner, right, with other investors, right? So your IRA can partner. be investing in an LLC with other with other IRAs or other members, and now you've created a multi-member LLC. But I'm not sure I understand the question. They're basically saying, as opposed to a single member LLC, 
you've got a multi-member LLC. Do you still need to form an LLC in Wyoming, Nevada, et cetera? I mean, if you have an LLC, it has to be formed in a state, right? Like, I mean, so I'm not sure I understand the question from that standpoint. I do. Uh, so limited liability, all entities are formed under state law, right? As opposed to federal. Okay, all companies, all corporations, LLCs, limited partnerships are all formed under state law. It really depends on what the activity of the company is doing or what's known as its business purpose. And that would determine, do you want to create your company in Nevada, Wyoming, and Delaware, obviously favorable jurisdictions, or if you have an investment property, let's say in Texas, you need to have an LLC in the state where the income producing property is located. That's why the Texas LLC would be owned by the Wyoming hub. So sometimes they have to be layered. Uh, but if you're doing, let's say, property management unrelated to the IRA, okay, just off to the side, you're doing property management, that LLC either has to be registered or foreign filed in any state or states where you are conducting property management services because that's on the ground in the state. So the short answer is it really depends on what the business activities of the company are that will help determine where it needs to be incorporated. Okay, next question. May I transfer my real estate LLC from Virginia Virginia to Wyoming? Um, it's, it would be a re-domiciliation. I hope I said that properly. Um, you, you, you can. Uh, that would be a schedule a free appointment with me because I would have to start asking questions, which would not be the appropriate thing to do here. Uh, but you, you can. I mean, would be the short end of the answer. Okay. Do so you need to. Yeah. Okay. So the next question, I'm, I think we should probably both answer because they didn't specify who they're talking to. Do you have someone who can give guidance for a client in Spanish? So on our end, um, I have somebody in the company. I think we have somebody who I could, who could translate where we could have like a three-way call where I, you know, they ask the question in Spanish and that person translates and, and then I respond back in English and then they translate to that. So if that's something that you would be amenable to, I think we have somebody in the company. I have a, a moderate ability to speak Spanish. Um, been studying it for a few years, but I certainly not like to talk about self-directed IRAs. What I have, do I have the uh, the wherewithal to be able to speak Spanish? So that that's our, our answer. Jay, if you want to answer for you. Um I mean, I speak Italian, but everything we do is in English. And so unfortunately, my answer would be no, um, we, yeah. we have no resources to to support. Uh, yeah, mine mine is really more, more geared towards no, but I there, we do have somebody in the company, I think is, is so, but it would just be, there would be a translation aspect. They're not in a role in the company where they could give guidance. They would have to, it would have to be a conversation with me that's being, uh, being interpreted. Okay. There's um, one, may I throw, may, Bill, I apologize. May I throw one thing out there? There is a company that I've used called Day Translations. They're pretty freaking expensive, to be honest with you, but everything they translate is court certified. Um, so if you needed to have documents translated, you know, the next day from English into Spanish or vice versa, uh, that's a company I've used for many, many years. I like them. I have no back-end profit from it. I'm just saying that's a resource. But anyway, sorry. Okay. Um, here's a pretty broad question. So let's, hopefully this doesn't take too long to answer because we got about 30, almost 40 questions still to answer. What are South wow. Dakota's single member rules? Off the top of my head, I would have to go to their state statute and look it up. Um, most states, in, even including states like Texas, uh, with, I'd have to pull up the statute, but they're normally a little vague. They don't normally specify that the that the exclusive remedy for a judgment creditor is applicable to an LLC with one or more than one member. So if it's not clear cut black and white, <clears throat> now you're off to the races with your attorney to, to try to prove your position and you're in an argument and spending a considerable amount of money to do it. So to the best of my knowledge, the last time I've checked, uh, South Dakota does not stipulate that, but I am open to being wrong. I would just have to pull up the legislation and, and see if something has changed recently. Okay, um, next question. 
But you said NTRUST serves as the single point of contact. Can we use NTRUST as the registered agent for the self-directed IRA LLC? For the, the answer to that is no. You wouldn't that use would be us. Yeah, no, nobody at NTRUST is going to be the registered agent for your LLC. That's either you or somebody that you hire or choose to have do that. But we're the custodian and record keeper of your retirement account only. You funnel investments through us, but that's our role. We don't operate. So, for example, if you have a property in your IRA or your LLC, we don't manage the property. So, no, we don't operate as a registered agent on your LLC. You do that or you have somebody else do it. Um, how do you manage IRA funds? Checkbook. Um, I, I'm, I, this is a short question, so I'm not sure I'm getting like your meaning here, but I mean, that's basically what this presentation has been about is if you want to have checkbook control over your IRA, the way to do it is by having your IRA invest in an LLC where you name yourself the manager of the LLC. And then as manager of the LLC, you make the investment decisions on behalf of the LLC. You create the LLC. You set the operating agreement. You open the bank account. You're the signatory on behalf of the LLC. That's how you get checkbook control over your IRA funds is by structuring it through an LLC as a pass-through entity that gives you that checkbook control. If you don't want to do it through an LLC, then Entrust writes the checks and does everything at your instruction. Your custodian does the, holds the money and writes the checks. Um, but that's how you that's how you get checkbook control over your IRA funds is by structuring through an LLC. Um, and it's a double edged. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. It's a double edged sword um, because you have so many more options, like Bill was referring to earlier, where you're not just stuck in traditional stocks, bonds, mutual funds on Wall Street in New York. You're opening it up to, to invest really in whatever you want, wherever you want. Uh, but the double edged sword comes in as you, you need to have a, a, an idea or a sense of what it is that you're doing so you don't engage in an activity which then makes your entire self directed IRA subject to becoming a taxable event. So uh, measure twice or measure 42 times and then cut once. So yeah, you still um, yeah, have, you have to, to know the you have to know the privative transaction rules. Like just because you funded an IRA with your funded an LLC with your IRA, you can't all of a sudden use that LLC to go buy your groceries with um, or, you know, to buy a car or anything like that. Right. It still has to be used. You can't use it to invest in, in uh, collectibles because those are those are disqualified. Those aren't allowed to be invested in IRAs. You can't go buy um, art with it. Right. That's considered a collectible. So you have to know the rules. Or at least, you know, reach out to Entrust, reach out to me to exactly. make sure that you're not doing anything that's prohibited. But ultimately, you're the one who has checkbook control. So it's incumbent upon you not to do anything that's prohibited. All right. So uh, you speak of putting your self-directed IRA into an LLC. How is mm -hmm. protection different if instead of your, your self-directed IRA invests in an LLC with a single high-risk asset? Uh, Jay, you can answer that. I don't see how protection is any different. Are you, are you I mean, I mean, Amelia, I'm gonna I'm gonna follow up. Do you are you asking how is the protection different if your IRA invests directly in a high risk asset versus your IRA investing in an LLC and the LLC invests directly in the high risk and in, invest in the high risk asset, right? Using the LLC as a as a pass through, how do you get you know instead of your IRA investing directly in, I don't know into into crypto, for example, um, um, as opposed to your IRA investing into the LLC and the LLC invests in crypto or real estate or whatever, like what's the additional liability protection? I, I think that's what- Yeah, what I'm following you. I'm, I'm following, the, I'm tracking you 100%. So if you invest into real estate in uh, directly into the name of your self-directed IRA and something goes wrong in the property, it's just going to wipe out your self-directed IRA, assuming there's nothing there, nothing else there, but that investment property. If you purchase the property in your, let's say, Wyoming or single member LLC and something goes wrong in the property, yeah, they can still wipe out everything in your self-directed IRA in the LLC. There's not much difference there either. Okay, So from that limited view, there is no difference. Okay, But there's two other differences. One would be if you layered your uh, IRA, so you have a holding IRA, uh, LLC, and then the subsidiary, which holds the uh, property in question. So if something goes wrong with the property in the LLC and you still have safe assets in the hub or you have other self-directed IRA baby LLCs to hold more real estate, you would only lose that one property rather than losing your entire 
self-directed IRA account. That's a big one. And then number two, let's go back to just one property. Okay, IRA versus LLC. If you got sued individually on your own time from something that happens, you go to a bar, you're watching a sports game, you're getting all excited, you get into a cat fight and scratch somebody's eyeball out and they sue you for pain and suffering and loss of work and all this other stuff and they get this huge judgment against you. If it's just in your IRA, remember that there's very limited protection. If any, they can come and attack it. Whereas if it's in the self-directed, in the LLC, you have asset protection there. So anyway, that's out of the three examples, the LLC is going to help you in two of the three of the examples that I just gave you. Yeah. And, and to be fair, somebody could just set up a separate IRA for each investment that they hold. Right. So if you hold multiple properties, you just create a unique uh, IRA each time you, you invest a new property. I had somebody, I did a presentation one time and somebody said, <clears throat> suggested that. So, um, right. So the next one, yes. can you please clarify the checkbook control? So I think I already did that a couple of questions ago. Um, your IRA invests in the LLC, you become the manager of the LLC, you have checkbook control using that LLC as a pass through. Um, Jay, is the last slide an example of a ser series LLC? And then they added on in Texas. Um, we're very familiar with series uh, limited liability companies. Uh, the, the challenge, short answer is no, my last slide was not a series LLC. Uh, we've had challenges being able to get uh, bank accounts open for series LLCs because across the board, uh, in mid-2018, uh, banks changed their internal policies where they now want to see articles of organization for the subsidiaries, which does not exist. So how can you give a bank something that doesn't exist to open the account? And their answer was exactly. They don't want the business. Um, really, the only jurisdictions we've been able to effectively utilize series LLCs is Illinois, uh, because they give you a certificate of existence, which the banks uh, accept because there's a fee for it. And it's issued by the state. Um, so uh, love series LLCs, but uh, it's another can of worms. I'm not opposed to it, but it's challenging. It's very challenging. It is. Okay. Um, next question. I already have a self-directed IRA in New York City. Okay. So before I read the rest of the question, an IRA is not in any particular state. An IRA is a federal thing. So if you mean you already have a self-directed IRA LLC in New York City, um, that's how I'm interpreting your question. Do I have to redo it so it's under the, the Wyoming holding, comp holding to have anonymity? Well, you would need it for anonymity and you would also need it to obtain charging order protection on a single member limited liability company, which New York definitely does not offer. Um, not in my opinion and experience anyway, not according to the statutes as I see it. Um, so yeah, you would just basically uh, create your Wyoming LLC and move it from New York, uh, just like the, I, I, I think it was a woman, um, moving it from Virginia uh, over to Wyoming. You can re-domicile it or just, you know, create a new company and move it on over. Okay. Uh, in the slide, as an example, you showed Wyoming as the hub. Is it safe to assume the hub could have been Nevada or Delaware? Yes. Nevada, and I love Nevada. We've got offices in both states. Don't get me wrong. Um, Nevada is $550 a year, a first year in filing fees, uh, $350 to renew. Whereas Wyoming is $100 and $60 to renew. Uh, Wyoming, excuse me, Nevada uh, discloses the name of the manager in the public domain, whereas Wyoming doesn't even know who it is. It doesn't disclose anything. Um, Delaware has an 8.8% state tax if there's business in the state as applicable, and they disclose all the information to the IRS. They're $390 a year to maintain, more expensive than Nevada, and of course, your information goes into the public domain. So all roads point toward Rome, which in this case just happens to be Wyoming. I think it's the best. And, and by the way, Wyoming is the progenitor of LLCs. They're the state that first created them back in 1977. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a great state um, for this type of application. So best anonymity, least expensive, great laws. I mean, yeah, I think Wyoming is the best choice. But if you want Nevada, we'll do it. It's no big deal. 
bit okay. more Okay. Um, next question says, just a week ago, I rolled over my 403B into my name to Entrust for a self-direct IRA. Thank you for your business. If I didn't state to have it in my LLC that I currently have, can I do that now? If I didn't state to have it in my LLC that I currently have, can I do that now? All right. So your IRA can, in, if you haven't invested your IRA into anything, you can invest your IRA into just about anything you want, but you can't invest it into an LLC that's already in your personal name that you already own personally. So if you're asking, can you have your IRA invest into an LLC that you already own? The answer to that is no. Can you create a new LLC and have your IRA invest into that LLC? Yes. You just have to name your IRA as the member of that LLC. If you've already invested your IRA into something else and you want to place that into an LLC, you can do that. You can set up an LLC and re-register the existing asset, whatever you may have invested in, to have it be held within the LLC rather than directly in the IRA. That's called an exchange. And um, your business development manager, whoever your, your BDM is, the, my colleague, would be your point of contact to help you with that. But again, where I'm getting caught up is you have, if I didn't state to have it in my LLC that I currently have, can I do that now? No. Your IRA can't invest into an LLC that you've already established in your personal name. That's a prohibited transaction. All right, next one. This may be a silly question, but can you clarify the relationship between the self-directed IRA and the LLC? There's cash in a property. The self-directed IRA becomes the member of the LLC. The LLC mm -hmm. then becomes the entity that invests in the cash and that holds the cash and invests in the property. So your IRA has the option to invest in just about anything you want. If you want to have it structured through an LLC, the IRA becomes the investor into that LLC, or otherwise known as the member of that LLC. Uh, okay, does a two-person LLC with your wife have the same protection from charging orders as non-family members? Jay, that's for you. Uh, yeah, it's in general, yes. The exception to the rule is normally if it's a spouse because... When you're married, are you two people or are you one person? And the answer is yes, you're both, right? I mean, you're two human beings, you're not, you know, can generally join at the hip, right? You're two people, but you're also one person by contract through marriage. So it goes into other areas, which are the operating agreement, the choice of tax return. Is it a disregarded entity? Is it going on a Schedule C, Schedule E? Is it filing a separate 1065? Um, but if the operating agreement is showing multiple members and it's filing a separate tax return, um, then generally, yes, you have the same asset protection that you would if it was a non-family member, albeit um, it certainly um, lends credibility to any argument in a defense if you had to mount one that you have Bob down the street as one of the members. I mean, that becomes a disinterested third party as another member. So it certainly bolsters it. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay. How is a Roth IRA not subject to taxes affect in regards to not having encumbrance to IRS? That would be you, Jay. That would be me? Affecting yeah, a... not having encumbrance. I mean, I mean, in terms of encumbrance to the IRS, I mean, a Roth IRA is not subject to federal to tax, tax yeah. as long as you're you've had a Roth IRA for at least five years and you're over the age of 59 and a half. Right. So I don't I don't. That's the answer. I guess that's the answer to the question. As long as you're over 59 and a half and, and you've had five a Roth for at least five years, any withdrawal <laughs> you take from that Roth IRA, any distribution is not subject to tax. I'm not sure what they mean by having encumbrance to the IRS. I thought maybe that was something, you know, that was- Yeah, with a bank. You may I'm have tried sure. Yeah. I, Jeff, I hope that answers your question. Um, can you post a phone number for asset protection services? Jay, you want to- Sure, seven seven five four six one five two five five seven seven five four six one five two five five. Andrew, if you have that, maybe type it into the chat box. 
Yeah, um, I will. And then real quick, Jeff clarified just to say, I am asking about the protection from charging orders since it's single ownership. In Nevada, Wyoming, and Delaware, you have charging order protection specifically on a limited liability company with only one member. Those are the only states that I know of where it specifically writes it out unequivocally in black and white in the legislation. Other states are very vague. Okay. Um, yeah. What is land trust and what's the advantage of using that to hold real estate? The, the number, uh, we've had a, a, a trust company for 18 years now. Uh, the number one reason for making use of a land trust in our experience is to, uh, for residential properties, this is not applicable to commercial, is to prevent a lender from invoking a due on sale clause. So if you just not related to self-directed IRAs, just in general, okay, with real estate investing in general, if you buy a property in your individual name, right, your name, not the IRA, and quit claim deed the property into an LLC, the bank can consider that a sale because the LLC is a different person from you, right? That was, that was one of the things that we covered. And so it is as if you sold the property to Chris, you know, on the other side of town and they say, great, well, now that you've sold your property of you 30 to 45 days to pay off the loan, right? So if you put the property into a land trust first under that federal piece of legislation, the Garden St. Germain Act, you can privately assign the property into the LLC you wanted to put it into in the first place but preventing the bank from invoking a due on sale clause in the process. So you just have to two-step it. And then, you know, behind that would just be anonymity, ease of transfer. There's no stepped up basis. There's no sales tax. There's no property tax. There's no transfer tax. Very ease, easy uh, to, to move title in that regard. But the number one reason is to avoid a due on sale clause with the lender, for sure. Okay, uh, next question. I've read about Wyoming, Nevada, Delaware LLCs not being as useful when that LLC does business in your home state, example, Texas, where maybe you also need to register the business in your home state too. But if the LLC is only holding safe assets, then this wouldn't apply, correct? That is correct. That is correct, which is also why we layer it with the bicycle wheel. So if you're doing business in the state, the entity is either needs to be what's called a domestic company, needs to be domesticated or formed in Texas, or it would need to be foreign filed in Texas. So you have to just dig in a little bit to what that business activity is to determine what you need to do. Um, some incorporators out there, which I am not in agreement with at all, they just want, no matter what you form, just form it in Nevada and Wyoming, they don't care that, that just, just that's not accurate. I mean, a, a lot of times, no, you, you either have to form an entity in the state where you're doing the business or for and file something there. So it's a very situation applicable, but in general, you are correct. Hey, you got to be careful, you know, with what you're doing. Okay. Uh, if you own an existing property in a self-directed IRA, can it be transferred to the LLC? Um, short answer, yes, but I wouldn't use the word transfer. Um so what you would do is you, when you have an LLC, when you have an investment, you need to fund that investment, right? So typically people who are going to use an LLC, they create an LLC, they fund the LLC with cash, and then they use that LLC to invest in the real estate. For example, in this particular case, you already have the LLC, or I'm sorry, you already have the property. Now you want to fund that LLC with the property. So with Entrust, what you would do is you'd create the LLC, you'd fill out our bi-direction form, and you would instruct us that you're funding that LLC with the property. Now you've got to go to your local municipality and change title on who owns that property from the Entrust Group FBO, your name and account number, to ABC LLC, right? You're re-registering the asset to being owned by directly by the IRA to being owned by the LLC. We would need that paperwork um, submitted to us as part of re-registering the asset and posting the and booking the asset into your account. But once we get that paperwork, then now your your property would be removed. Uh, from our books, and it would just show the LLC with the value of whatever the value of the property is. And so now your IRA owns that property, or your LLC owns that property instead of the IRA owning the property. 
but the LLC is owned by the IRA. So indirectly, your IRA now owns that property. But yes, again, the word is not transfer. Um, you're funding your LLC with the property rather than with cash. But then um, you still also have to file a deed with the county recorder's office to reflect that change in the public domain. Yeah, Nothing's yeah. Happening. And Nothing. we need yeah. that. And we need that. For deed, sure. Right. Which we do. Mm -hmm. Um you just removed a, a question, Andrew, that I didn't get a chance to answer, I think. Um, we had two people beneficiaries who inherited a self-directed IRA 50-50 and an LLC. So there are two members. Technically, wouldn't or shouldn't both be managing members? Um, no, they are not members. The IRAs are the members. The individuals are not members. Right. When you have an IRA make an investment, it's the IRA that's the entity that owns that investment. So if you set up a if 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 the if the individuals what what would happen is the individuals would now have to set up what are called beneficiary IRAs, unless it's a spouse and they can take it into their own account. But now the beneficiary IRA becomes the member of the LLC, not the individuals. So the individuals can both be managers. But no, they wouldn't be managing members because the IRAs are the members. Has to be manager managed, correct? Right. They have to be manager managed LLCs when it's owned by an IRA. Um, does California charge $800 for each LLC formed out of state? Also, do they charge $800 for land trusts? Uh, great question. The answer is with regards to the land trust, there are no... Uh, franchise tax board fees on inter vivos trusts. Inter vivos means among or between the living. So a land trust is basically like a little baby living trust. Uh, there are no franchise tax board fees on uh, inter vivos or living trusts, which includes land trusts. No fees from the franchise tax board. Uh, California charges that $800 a year uh tax to all entities in California. It doesn't matter whether it's corporation, limited partnership or LLCs. LLCs are a little bit worse because they have a graduated tax. It starts at $1,800. $800. And then if you do like, I believe it's a quarter of a million dollars or, or more in gross revenues, it then goes up to like $1,700 and finishes out at like 12 grand if you you know moved whatever millions of dollars through it. So there's a stair step on uh, taxes and LLCs. Um, if you are a resident of California and you manage an out-of-state LLC, even if you have not been required to foreign file that LLC in California through the Secretary of State, the California Franchise Tax Board, its publication 789, is still trying to impose their might to say, well, you're doing it for the intent of making profit, therefore we want our $800 because California has a never ending desire for more money. Um, and so they can impose additional fees on out of state entities if you are a California resident or um, if it's not an IRA and there's other members, if any one of the members is a resident in California, it can be subject to the $800 fee in out of state instances. So, or if you're doing, I would business, say skip. Or if you're doing business in California, right? Like even if you're out of state resident, out of state LLC, if you're investing in a property in California, California, you now have to establish nexus oh. in that state and pay the fee. Oh yeah, if you're doing business in the state, yeah, you have to pay the fee hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, would you consider private equity interest a safe or risky asset? I, I'm just going to jump in here really quickly. All investments inherently have some amount of risk, right? Like publicly traded stocks in a publicly traded company, that company can go out of business. Um, so there's risk inherent in every single investment that you make, right? So uh, Jay, you can answer that at this point, but that's just my quick response on this safe versus risky. That is correct. I, and I'm not sure if the question was directed towards safe versus, you know, safe asset versus high risk asset, that type of risk. Yeah, I think one is. of the risks is, yeah. Um, Generally, any type of uh, liens, um, hard money loans, things of that nature, they're, they're safe assets unless you have to collect the debt, take the title to whatever you were loaning the money on. You just want to make sure that asset is titled somewhere outside of the entity used to give the loan. But those loans are, as the lender, you don't have liability from whatever happens 
to the person or the thing to whom you issued the loan, right? So that's a safe asset. Okay, uh, the next question I answered, I'll, I'll read it, but I answered a couple minutes ago. What if you already own real estate with your interest self-directed IRA? Can you change the arrangement now after the fact? Can you create the LLC and then revise, change the deed to the real estate investment? And in short, yes, you have to fund that LLC with the property rather than than um, with cash, right? But yes, you can do that. Uh, is there- and Then we have to change the title. Then you have to change title. Yeah, you have to change yes. title from the IRA to the LLC. Um, and that paperwork needs to be submitted to your custodian to ensure that, that and actually that's probably gonna have to be signed by the custodian in order to affect mm -hmm. change, right? From the, from Because you're moving it from the IRA to the LLC. Usually that that's paperwork correct. has to be signed by the original owner of that property, and which notarized. in this case would be the IRA. Um, is there a time limit for taking the money out? My understanding is five years, you cannot take the money out. All right. I'm not sure what you're talking about taking the money out of what? Can you take money out of an IRA? Is there a time limit? No. Can you take money out of an LLC? I don't think there's a time limit there. I'm not really sure what you mean by taking the money out in the five-year thing. So um, you're going to need to expand maybe, on that a little bit. Maybe with a Roth? I don't know. Well, well, Roth IRA, Sorry. you have to have a Roth for at least five years, right? Five years. If somebody, exactly. if somebody open and be over 59 and a half, both of those. So if you have a Roth with like Fidelity and you transfer that Roth over to Entrust and buy real estate, that five years started from the time you opened the Fidelity account, not the time you trans. So, so it's from the time that you originally have a Roth IRA, not just the Entrust Roth IRA, right? So- if you have a if you've opened a Roth IRA today and you're 60 years old, you've only met 50% of the qualifications to take that distribution and avoid any taxes, right? It doesn't mean you can't take the money out. You'll just have to pay taxes on it like you would in like a traditional IRA, right? Not on your contribution, but on any earnings. Um, if risky asset, should I set up an LLC and transfer interest? I think this was the person who was asking about um, the private placement. By, by private equity interest. Um, if you determine it's a risky asset, should they set up an LLC and transfer the interest in that that private, I guess, startup company into the LLC is what they're asking, Jay. Yeah, what, you just have to layer it, in my opinion. That's what I was trying to share with you. Have your Wyoming hub. And then if you have an asset, which you deem to be risky insofar as liability for assets, litigation, exposure, you create a wholly owned subsidiary LLC, um, which Bill, you had suggested that someone else said, well, you could just create a brand new, effectively a hub for every single one. Whereas we just operate more on a bicycle wheel to keep your life simpler and happier and not so spread thin. It's far less complicated, but you just, you need that second layer, which you didn't have to, but that's just, I mean, that's just the way the system works. So you just, you just layer it. And you only need one extra layer, the hub and, you know, where the rubber meets the road, that's where the LLC that has the high risk, you would stick it into that. Okay. And that way your self-directed IRA is limited to doing other things. Okay. Um, so we still got 20, 20 questions, roughly. We've held on to about 60% of the original attendees. So we're doing okay here. Um, they're starting to drop off though. Um May I transfer my self-directed IRA real estate LLC from Virginia to Wyoming? Could you just repeat that? I'm sorry. Can he sorry. transfer a can he transfer an LLC from Virginia to Wyoming? It, it's not a transfer, it's a redomiciliation. Um we would probably just create a brand new Wyoming company and then work with Entrust to move the ownership of your Virginia company, which is owned by the self-directed IRA from the Virginia shell, for lack of a better term, over to the Wyoming company. Yeah, that's just a re-registration on the LLC. Like that's just- that's Not just a re a, It's a for brand us. new company. For us. Oh, for, for you. Entrust. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. That would be yeah. what's called a re-registration. You're changing title yeah. within Entrust. Our paperwork, we have a bi-direction form you'd fill out and call it a, a, a exchange. Um, 
and you would just exchange out the one asset for another asset. From an internal paperwork, you would just need to provide an, an updated operating agreement for the new LLC. In terms of like what you'd have to do, yeah, it seems to me you're terminating the one LLC and starting a whole new LLC. Um, Start the new one and then terminate the old one when the transfer yeah, is done. Yeah, and that yes, was, exactly. Um, what if a property with a mortgage is deeded to the LLC owned by a trust? Well, what if it was? Uh, what's the question? Okay. <laughs> um, oh, wait. They, they expanded on it a little bit on the next oh, okay. one. Would they be able to call on call on the due on sale clause? Uh, so if you could start the question for me, if the property if, is... If property okay. with a mortgage is deeded to an LLC from, let's say, a family trust, right? It, um, it could be. The, the bank could invoke a due on sale clause... Uh, because uh, when you have a family trust, which are generally revocable living trusts, right, for the avoidance of probate, when you're transferring it from the, or even if it was irre irrevocable, it doesn't matter. When you're transferring it over to an LLC, the banks can consider that a sale rather than transferring the deed. You might assign it, but it'd have to be a land trust. <sighs> So the answer is yes, they could invoke a due on sale clause. You've got to put a land trust in the middle. It's the Garden St. Germain Depository Institutions Act that prevents, it's federal law that prevents the lenders from invoking the due on sale clause. That's the tool you have to utilize. How to go about doing it specifically for your situation. I mean, just schedule the free appointment. I'm happy to help you with it. Um, okay, next question says, will the LLC subject to LLC be subject to UBIT or do UDFI when its member is a self-directed IRA? UBIT stands for unrelated business income tax or unrelated debt financed income tax when its member is a self-directed IRA. The answer is yes, it could be. If your LLC is using leverage to buy that property, if it's using borrowed money, then it's probably going to be subject to unrelated debt financed income tax. Um, if the LLC is being used to, let's say, own a franchise, um, then it could be subject to UBIT. Yeah, for sure. Just having an LLC as an entity pass through doesn't eliminate the UBIT or UDFI rules. Um, this next thing just simply says state filing requirements for LLCs and annual fees with a question mark. That feels a little too broad to be able to answer. There are state filing requirements oh, yeah. and most states have an annual fee. Annual fee. I think that would probably be mm -hmm. how I would answer that. Yeah, and they vary not only from state to state, but within the state, depending on the type of entity. But yes, there are fees and also registered agent fees and office and mail forwarding fees, depending on what you're doing. So there are annual fees for sure. Some states don't have them, but- um, But there's other them. related expenses. Yeah, like, I mean, Texas doesn't, officially have an annual state fee with the secretary of state, but then you have your franchise tax board fee. Missouri. So it, Missouri doesn't have one. You know how okay. I know that? I have an LLC in Missouri. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, can you talk about tax strategy and tax implications, advantages of putting existing assets, equities and real estate, as well as new investments into a self-directed IRA? Is there a Roth version of a self-directed IRA? Okay. So first of all, yes. A self-directed IRA is not a type of account. It's a description of the service we provide. So a Roth IRA can be self-directed, a traditional IRA can be self-directed, a 401k can be self-directed, a SEP IRA can be self-directed, any type of retirement account can be self-directed. The definition of self-directed simply means you make all your own investments decisions and the custodian you have your account with holds non-traditional investments. That's what it means to be a self-directed IRA. It's not a type of account. Um, you can't put existing assets into a self-directed IRA. Like if you currently own real estate or if you currently own equities in your personal name, you can't simply place them into an IRA. You have to make contributions in cash and then you use the cash to purchase an investment. So you're, the way you're asking this, talk about the tax strategy and tax implications advantages of putting existing assets, equities and real estate, as well as new investments into a self-directed IRA. You, that's, that's not a thing. You make contributions of cash into the IRA and then the cash purchases whatever investment you wanna make. So that's my answer to your question. Uh, 
Okay, so someone expanded, I think, on a previous. What I mean is that you are at risk in some states if you only have one member. So if you don't ha want to form a single member LLC because you will have at least two members, then that risk goes away so you can create LLC in any state. I don't remember the question that was asked that this is expanding upon. Does, does this bring it, a bill there, Yeah, it does. But again, it's going back to when you say risk, it, it depends whether it's an inside or an outside lawsuit. So let's say you have an LLC in any state. It doesn't matter whether it's a single member or a multi-member. Okay. You still have limited liability protection. If something goes wrong in that company, they cannot come after you in your individual capacity unless you've done something to warrant that, like you, you know, punch someone in the face, that you did something personally. You have individual liability protection. What you're referring to, I believe, is with regards to an outside suit, where if you get into a bar fight, then someone sues you and they want to take all of your money or take all of your assets in the company. Someone's attacking the company from the outside, right? There's litigation unrelated to the business activities of the company. And now they want to go into the company and take that money to satisfy a judgment. That's where you get into, is it single member? Is it multi-member? Is it husband? Is it wife? Where is it, you know, domiciled? What is it doing, et cetera? That's where the issue of single member, husband, wife, unrelated members come into play is for outside suits. There is no charging order protection on an inside suit. So if something goes wrong in the company, whatever's in it is 100% at risk. And there's just really nothing you can do to protect it except for insurance. Maybe. That's it. So. Okay. Uh, next question says, if I establish, if establish a multi-member LLC, say grandson and granddaughter Coverdell accounts with their mother into one LLC with mom being the manager, there are existing real estate assets in, and they mention a competitor of ours, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to mention the name of the custodian. There are existing real estate assets in this other custodian and need to be transferred to the newly formed LLC, how to word the deed and does it require two transfers? So again, as I answered this question before, it's not a transfer, it's a funding of the LLC. And so if you have a one of those accounts that is, is holding these properties and you want to fund that. LLC with those properties, along with the grandson and the granddaughter, then that's going to determine the percentage ownership of that LLC with part of the, the, the funding for the, you know, the, the mom, it sounds like being the properties, and then maybe the grandson, and the granddaughter being in cash for a total valuation of the LLC and each account, each, each um, IRA holder becomes a percentage owner of that LLC. And any of the, the assets are held now um, percentage wise from each of the investors, right? Um, how to word the deed, the deed is going to change from where it's now held directly by the IRA to being held by the LLC. You're going to have to change titling on the deed to be held by the LLC. And does it require two transfers? These are not transfers, these are fundings. You would have to talk to the other custodian that you currently have the accounts with on how to go about funding that LLC with the properties rather than with cash. They're going to have their own paperwork for that. We have our paperwork, they're going to have theirs. Um, are there any disadvantages to, I have an opinion on this, Jay, but I'm going to let you answer it first. Are there any mm -hmm. disadvantages to forming a self-directed IRA real estate LLC? I, it doesn't necessarily even have to be a self-directed IRA. Or is there any disadvantages to forming an LLC outside the state where a property is located? Disadvantages. Yeah. Well, yes. Um, Fees, right? Well, no, let me, I'm pausing because it's <laughs> a bazillion things running through my head. <laughs> when it comes to holding real estate, we 100% recommend that the LLC, which owns that investment property, excuse me, has either been formed in the state where the income producing property is located and generating money and creating business profit, or it be foreign filed to be there. If you have a Florida property and it's owned by a Wyoming company, 
but the Wyoming company has not been foreign filed or registered to conduct business in Florida. And there is a lawsuit. Now the plaintiff has got a whole bunch of things that they can put on the table. Like your honor, this is a scam. This is a sham. They've been trying to evade Florida state taxes or potential uh, uh, judgment creditors for known issues on the property. And then Florida could say, well, you haven't foreign filed, where are your fees? There's a $400 a year late fee and you have to pay us for that and plus penalties and interest and blah, blah, blah. So um, that's why we avoid that by if you have a Wyoming or Nevada or Delaware hub, you just create the Florida LLC. In, in this example, I'm just pulling Florida out of the air in the state where the property is located to avoid all of that. Yeah, yeah. in my opinion, you really need to have an LLC in the state where the income producing property is located, or I can just open up a whole can of worms. I mean, it seems to me, um, whenever you're investing from an LLC into a state, you have to establish nexus in that state for that LLC. So if you establish an LLC in one state that has an annual fee, you're going to pay that annual fee. And then you buy a property in another state, and that state has a fee, you're going to have to pay that state a fee. Right. Yeah, and, and worse. Now you're paying that and, fee to, to two different states to buy a price. And it's worse. You're going to buy a state and a property in a state, then it only makes sense to me to establish an LLC in that state. That is correct. And, and to add to that, it's even worse than that. So let's say you form your company in Wyoming and then you register it in Florida. Now you're under Florida law and Florida goes out of their way to say there is no charging order protection on single member limited liability companies. I mean, they, they try to like throw it in your face and say, you got to have a multi-member company, whatever. So now you're under Florida law and you don't even have the benefit of the Wyoming law that you thought you had when you created the company there. Yeah. So got to structure it properly. Okay. Um, so Sorry. next question says, um, knowing the LLC member is the IRA, if there is a charging order, can you move funds directly back to the IRA without it being a distribution, avoiding having to pay anything to the debtor? All right. So Jay, I'm going to let you answer this question, but first I'm going to say that moving a money from the IRA back to the I or moving money from the LLC back to the IRA is never a distribution. It's only a distribution when you take a withdrawal from the IRA. Moving the money between the LLC, between the IRA and the LLC, from the IRA to the LLC is a funding, from the LLC back to the IRA is a return on investment. Or, or, or if you're deciding that you're going to terminate the LLC, uh, that money has to flow back to the IRA. That's not a distribution, right? Now, Jay can answer the question as far as like, can you, can you uh, do that to, to um, avoid the, the, the um, charging order? Bill, you're going to have to forgive me because you have the question in front of you where you could see it. And, yeah, and let you me said, read it again. Yeah, thank knowing, you a little slower. My, <laughs> okay. Knowing the LLC member is the member of the IRA, uh -huh. is that if there is a charging order, can you simply move the fund? Basically, what he's asking is, can you just terminate the LLC and move the money back to the IRA and avoid the charging order by, you know, by doing that? Well, the charging order is in the event of an outside lawsuit. Um, it's actually to your benefit. N normally, most people would never even do that because they can actually sue their attorney uh, that recommends that they do that because they have to pay taxes on money they can't collect. So most people are never going to do that. Um, I, I don't know. It, it could be maybe considered the potential to defraud or evade a potential or known judgment creditor. I mean, the, the company might need to sit there, you know, yeah. in the LLC, because otherwise you're just moving it back to the member. Um, it's not, it's technically not a distribution. No, but the judgment creditor is just normally not going to sit there on the outside that long because of their tax liability. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's certainly a legal question, right? Yeah, I don't know that I could feel that one 100%. I'd actually have to sit down and noodle it a little bit. Um, because okay. then if you move it, well, hold on. Because then if you, well, actually, I apologize. I just had to noodle my way through that one. Actually, I don't even know if you would want to do that because the money is protected in the LLC. If you move it back to the IRA, then they're just going to go and attack and attach the judgment to the, to the self-directed IRA, which doesn't have any protection. So you wouldn't want to do that. 
even if you could, you wouldn't want to. You'd want it to stay in the LLC. Yeah, there, Sorry. There, you know, the that. final part of that question is uh, is avoiding having to pay anything to the debtor. And I don't I don't think there's any way of You'd, like necessarily avoiding that per se. They're just putting themselves in another legal quagmire. Um, you'd want it to stay in the LLC. Yeah. Another question is about moving the deed of trust slash promissory note slash carry back. Okay, so again, from this, I think it's the same person that asked about this holding with a different custodian, not from this other custodian to Entrust Group, then to Grace Holdings LLC. The question is, in the assignment of deed of trust, who is the assignee and who is the assignor? I think I answered that. Who needs to notarize this? The, the assignee would be your current custodian, your current IRA, and the assign no. The assignee would be the new uh, LLC Recipient. and the assignor would be your current IRA. And who needs to notarize this? The uh, IRA. Assignor. Because that's, who is, that's who's currently holding the property. Um, can you transfer your pension account to a self-directed IRA? That's a good question. Talk to your pension provider. Find out if they have any buyout options because... Um, essentially, a pension is a guaranteed payment for life, um, but a lot of pension companies will offer a lump sum buyout. And if they offer a dollar amount, a lump sum buyout, then yes, you can roll that over to an IRA. Uh, with a single member LLC, am I using my social security number as the tax ID number? You're using your social security number in order to obtain the EIN, which is an employer identification number with the IRS, right? The Internal Revenue Service. After that point, the new EIN is the new tax ID for your LLC. You, you yeah. don't use your social security from then on out. Yeah, and I'm gonna expand on that. If you're going to be the member of the LLC, then you use your uh, your social security number to uh, like open up the LLC and then you apply for a tax ID number for the LLC. If you're using an IRA, then you get an, an EIN for the IRA and the IRA's tax ID number is used to then apply for the EIN for the LLC itself. Are um, you doing paper filings for that? Because they won't take that online. Not my experience. Okay, next one. When I, are you asking okay. me? <clears throat> I was, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they can. We, we. There's um. There is a, a place on the IRS website that you can apply for an EIN for your um IRA. Um, you go to where the application is, and then there's a, a like it has a bunch of different options on the reason why you're applying for an EIN, and one of those has other. And if you click on other, it takes you to a second page where one of the options is IRS or IRA. So you're getting an EIN for the IRA, and then you're trying to use that EIN to get the EIN for the LLC? Correct. Okay, that's why I've never done it, because I've never had to, okay, I'm not in your shoes. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Um, although we don't we don't <clears throat> apply for the EIN, we instruct the account holder to. Um, right, because with the, with, the, with the IRS, they basically never accept an EIN to get an EIN. They expect to have the social security number to get an EIN. It's just they don't. There's a well, spot I mean, where you can do it. Then, then they okay, that that may be the case. Um, but then you're yep. providing your social security number not as the member, but as the manager of the LLC. Right? No, you're not. The, um, they they would have to because you're still the tax the liable taxpayer for the self-directed IRA at the end of the day. So it goes through the IRA and at the end of the day it's back to you. Okay. Uh when I want to take a cash distribution, why do I have to send said cash to Entrust and then request a distribution from them? Because your IRA is the owner of the LLC, not you. So the money has to flow back to the original member, which is the IRA itself. You can't just take cash directly from the LLC. That is specifically a prohibited transaction. And if you were to do that, you've now put your IRA at risk of being becoming disqualified and having tax consequences of, of the entire account becoming a distribution to you and then having to pay taxes and then any penalties under the 59 and a half. That's just simply the rules. That's why you have to. Do I need to do an LLC if I have checkbook control in my self-directed solo 401k? 
You don't, no. So one no. of the unique things about a 401k is that's different from an IRA is that you are the trustee or custodian of your own 401k plan. So um, so you can have, you can, you can, we have what's called a plan only option where we provide you the plan documents, but you do all your own record keeping on behalf of your 401k. So you take your plan documents, you go establish a bank account on behalf of your 401k. And then you, um, and then you, uh, you now have checkbook control over your 401k without an LLC being involved. So no, you don't have to have an LLC from a, from a checkbook control standpoint. Now there can be other, like, you know, Jay's talked about other liability protection and other reasons why you might want to establish an LLC, but purely from a checkbook control standpoint, no, you don't need to have an LLC. You've already got it through the, um, through the, uh, 401k. And you only have to produce like $500 every single year, which you could just do on the schedule C and you qualify as an individual too. So yeah, I agree. Uh, can a trust be the manager of the LLC and does the TTEE need to be disclosed under CTA? So I don't know what TTE and CTA are. Trustee. Trustee. Oh, trustee need to be disclosed under C Can a trust be the manager of the LLC? I mean, I think a manager has to be a person, right? Correct. So if the... If the trust names well, a manager, can that manager then just by default be the manager of the LLC? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. That might be a legal question. But well, from a standpoint, of, I would think an, an individual needs to be named as a manager. You can't name an entity. That's why an IRA can't be a manager because it's not a person, right? It's just a it's an IRA. And so a manager is going to be someone who, one, makes the investment decisions, maybe has voting rights, I don't know, like those various things um, that require to be an individual. So I would expect that you need to name the individual as the manager of the LLC. In, in a self-directed IRA, I believe so, with just an, you know, outside of the self-directed IRA environment, we're just talking about normal LLCs. Yeah, yeah that's how uh, I read you know, the sure. question. That's how I yeah, read the mission is just, you know, not a self-directed IRA, but just simply he's got an LLC and he's once named the trust as the manager of the LLC. You would have to. Uh, it has to be a person that I am aware person. of. I mean, yeah. yeah, it has to be a person, which is a human being or another entity. It could be a trust if it's irrevocable. But beyond that, you'd have to seek counsel. It's yeah. got to be a person. Yeah, talk to yeah. Her. Does Wyoming LLC tell IRS who the manager is? No, they do not, because Wyoming does not know. Uh, the only person who knows who the manager of any Wyoming LLC is the registered agent, which is why we have to tame just some basic due diligence information. So we know we're not creating an LLC for Osama bin Laden's cousin or something. But uh, Wyoming doesn't disclose it because they can't disclose it because they don't know. They don't even ask. It's never been provided to them. They have no clue. Okay, um, next one's just a comment said that New, New Mexico is also a great state for um, LLCs. Um, lots of great states. Yeah, Arizona. I mean, there's lots of great states. It's just the question becomes is who is the single member of the LLC? If it's an individual, it's in question. If the, in, if the single member of an out of state LLC is one of those three hubs, you're in a far better position. Uh, there's lots of great states. For sure. Yeah. Um, they also asked to please repeat and show IRS rule 77. 77-137. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, this person, so Shabazz is still on the, um, is still on the, uh, the thing. Um, maybe you want to email um, Jay at his email address show in there, info as, at asset protection services, and he can um, provide that to you. What do you think? Jay, how's that sound? Yeah, it's 77 is the year, dash 137 is the ruling for that year. It's IRS ruling 77 dash 137. Okay. Um, my self directed IRA has two LLCs under it with the same custodian. If something goes wrong with one LLC, lawsuit, et cetera, is my other LLC under jeopardy or my losses are limited to the LLC in question? I would say talk to a lawyer about that. Jay, I don't know if you want to. Uh, Experience. Losses would be limited to the LLC in question, one of the babies. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't know. Maybe there's always some exception to the rule, but that's the whole point. Yeah, losses would be limited to that baby LLC. Exactly. Okay, here's a repeat question. Will the LLC be subject to the UBIT or UDFI when its member is a self-directed IRA? I already answered that. Um, it could be. 
If your IRA is using leverage or running a business, then sure. My point in that is that having an LLC does not take away the UBIT or UDFI rules, right? An LLC is just being used as a pass-through. And it's making investments and it's using leverage and it's doing a business or whatever. It's going to be the same UBIT or UDFI rules as if your IRA was investing directly or borrowing money directly. Having an LLC doesn't change that. Um, okay, we're down to the last few questions. I we, we still have people hanging tight. Appreciate you guys hanging on this long. Um, can an LLC partner with other members? An LLC partner with other members. We created an LLC which has four members and one member IRA LLC and one of member IRA LLC and not from mainly members. Can other three members can take mortgage loan on property, whereas IRA LLC will put investment as cash? Wow. I am not able to understand this question. I think, I think I'm tracking it. So you have one LLC that has four members in it. One of the members in that LLC <clears throat> is an LLC owned by a self-directed IRA that has made its cash, contrib uh, cash contributions through the self-directed IRA into its own LLC, which is a member of this big LLC. And then the other three members, let's assuming they're you know individuals, natural persons or whatever. Yeah, they can go out and get a mortgage for the LLC to buy a property and let's say well, they split the- Well, they can go get their own loans, yeah. but the they can't get a mortgage for the LLC, no. Either the LLC is a borrower or the individual members are borrowing individually and then using that money to fund, add additional money to the LLC. But you still have to stay true to the percentage ownership that you established under that LLC when you created the four members, right? So if they're each 25% members and you're looking to add additional funding to that LLC, each member is responsible for its 25%, right? Well said. Or well the said. IRA, or or I'm sorry, or the LLC just borrows the money, and that means that all four members are essentially borrowing 25% of whatever the money that's being borrowed. It's one or the other. <clears throat> okay, and then they say, can IRA LLC be eligible for a mortgage on shore? An, L an IRA LLC can borrow money. Um, if my wife and I fund a real estate purchase using our IRA, say 2080 split through a checkbook control LLC, will both my wife, both mine and my wife's IRAs be members? Sure, if you want it to be. Will both of us need to be managers? Sure, if you want it to be, you don't have to be. How will the income be distributed to the individual IRAs at 20 and 80%, right? If you're funding, if you have IRAs that are funding an LLC and the split is 20 and 80%, then that means that all expenses, if you have to add additional funding to that LLC, then they have to be added at the 20 and 80%. And any revenue that's generated gets paid out at the 20 and 80%. Whatever you establish at the time you created the LLC is how things have to be to continue to be distributed. Um, does changing title to a property from the interest group to a new LLC typically trigger a property tax reevaluation event? No. Um, so in order for in order for us to um to in order for you to fund an L, like an an IRA uh with an L, or an LLC with an I, with a property we're going to need a um we're going to need a um a uh, assessment because it needs to be funded at the valuation of the property so would the assessment itself trigger a property tax reevaluation event I don't know Jay do you know the answer to that my answer would be no, because there's no change in what's called the UBO, the ultimate beneficial owner of the property. So in trust uh, requiring uh, an evaluation is for their own internal policies or Correct. to meet regulations. That's, but right. that's not going to inherently spark a reassessment for taxes on the property because you're moving the property from your right hand to your left hand from the self-directed IRA into an LLC which is owned by the self-directed IRA as opposed to transferring it to Bob down the street. So no, at the, at the county tax assessor's office, no, that's not going to uh, spark a, a tax reevaluation or have a new stepped up basis. Okay. Can there be additional funding from the IRA into the LLC after the initial funding has been done? Yes, certainly. Um, but just again, bear in mind, if it's a multi-member LLC, 
then each member has to stay true to its percentage. So if you have a 50-50, for example, and you want to add additional $10,000 from the one from the IRA, then whoever the other member is also has to add their $10,000, right? You have to stay true to the percentages that were established. Um, okay. Um, explain how a land trust allows you to use an out-of-state LLC to avoid in-state fees. For example, the property is in California and currently in my self-directed IRA, I'm a Nevada resident. Oh, you're a Nevada resident. Yeah. So assuming it's a residential property, because remember land trusts are property, only applicable. Property is in California. Understood. Uh, but land trusts themselves are only applicable to residential properties. They're not applicable in the commercial world. So or investment like property, that. you mean? No, it, it doesn't matter whether it's investment. It, is it residential investment or is it all, commercial investment? All he said is the property is in California and currently in the self-directed IRA and that they're a Nevada resident. So it doesn't state whether it's a multifamily, commercial, whatever. Right. That's why I was pointing that out. Because if it's commercial, just throw the land trust out the window. It's oh, he just said it's residential. Perfect. Okay. So once you're on the radar with California, it's a little difficult, but let's assume and presume we're starting with a new property. <clears throat> if the, well, let's just take it from where you are. So if you take the property and you quit claim deed it into a land trust, the procedure goes that the beneficial owner, the, the ultimate beneficial interest holder of that land trust must be the same the day after the transfer as it was the day before the transfer, right? So you own it Monday, you put it into land trust on Tuesday, and on Wednesday, it's still the self-directed IRA. It's still the same situation. However, several business days later or the next week, you can privately assign the ownership of the land trust into let's say a Utah company or a Nevada company or a Wyoming company and it's the beneficial interest holder of the land trust. The land trust is not subject to the $800 a year filing fee because it's an inter vivos trust. There's there's really no way for they can't do it. They don't do it. You know, California does not impose the $800 a year filing fee on inter vivos trusts. So that's how you would do it. You would just make the the ultimate beneficial owner of the land trust and out of state LLC. Okay, last question. And Jay, this one is for you. With the hub and spoke LLC model, is the hub LLC the member of the spoke LLC? Yes. All right. Wow. This is, I can't remember the last time. I remember when I first started doing these uh, a, a handful of years ago, I had one that was the same thing. We just had a bunch of questions that we kept answering and it ended up taking a couple hours, but it's been a long time since I've had one that had lasted this long. So for those of you who hung hung here this long, we appreciate the, uh, um, we appreciate you um, sticking with us. Jay, I appreciate you taking all the time as well and, and providing all the great Thanks information. There is all of our content, mine and Jay's contact information. If you need anything else, have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out and join us next month again as we, I forget, what is it? Digital digital currencies. We're going to be talking about uh, something about investing in digital currencies. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. Jay, thanks again. Bill, thank you.